Natasha, welcome back. We'll continue with this and what I want to do this time is look at the second stanza, the beginning part of this. And we could say that it is the part, the flame healing. Second stanza, I'll just read it as we have it here in this translate, this English translation. O sweet cautery, O delightful wound, O gentle hand, O delicate touch, that tastes of eternal life and pays every debt. In killing, you change death to life. That might sort of pass over our heads nowadays, but I think somebody in 16th century Spain who would hear that, a shudder would come down their spine at the, at the thought of this cautery, this cauterizing devices. Doctors and nurses nowadays are very gentle, and, <laughs> but the healing methods in the six, but it was Britain was the same, it was no different, or anywhere were a little short of cruelty and sometimes more akin to a form of butchery than, uh, <laughs> than real medicine. And a few years later, John de Cross himself, when he's in the last few months of his life, the kind of medical treatment he received was just horrific. And that's what. He's starting off here with this cauterizing, this sweet cautery, this delicate wound. The gentle hand, the delicate touch. And so if we are to get a sense of what John is conveying here, we've got to, in a sense, put ourselves into that world. And the imagery that John is using of somebody, this device into the fire and applying it to whatever part of the body they think needs it, <laughs> and quite literally burning the person. And that's the, that's the imagery that John is using here in this, this first part of this second stanza here. And we need to be aware of that. So, I said, this comes to the part where this flame heals. And just give first of all his summary here, then I want to look particularly at the cautery and the wound. In the stanza, the soul proclaims how the three persons of the most blessed trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are the ones who effect this divine work of union in it. Thus the hand, the cautery, and the touch are in substance the same. The soul applies these terms to the persons of the Trinity because of the effects each of the persons produces. The cautery is the Holy Spirit, the hand is the Father, the touch is the Son. The soul here magnifies the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit stressing the three admirable favours and blessings they produce in it, having changed its death to life, transforming it in the Trinity. So, the transformation taking place here by changing death to life. 
a total transformation. Here the emphasis is upon what the Trinity is doing in the soul. But we need to be careful here. Language can mislead us. Yes, this is the Trinity healing, touching, hand on, delicacy, wounding. But not something that's outside of themselves. But from within. I don't know how would I, I'd illustrate what I mean. You know, it's the doctor working on somebody, it's another person. Whereas here it is a doctor in a sense has gone into the person, is has become the person. Is one with the person. <clears throat> so the action uh, the, so the the healing that is taking place here is a healing from within, brought about by the inner union presence of the Trinity. One needs to carefully read this to see how John is conveying this in various ways. Yes, the soul is, as we saw in the previous one, receiving. Is being healed, is growing, is changing. And is being united, or is already united with the Trinity. So we... We just get, look at a little bit of it, just see how John tries to <coughs> express this for us. He's trying to express what having all stated for us and shown us the presence of the Trinity that comes and lives within the person. Now that Trinity is showing its effects, the effects of its presence by the healing and transformation that's taking place. And so we've got the wound, what he calls this delightful wound got this delicate touch that somehow tastes of eternal life, the tastes of something that's beyond life we've got here. And a transformation, this gentle hand, gift in which all debts are paid. Okay, so let's have a look a little bit more closely at this cautery. Which, as I said, is a rather not very pleasant instrument, but was very commonly used in John's time for, for healing. I suppose you either he he either healed you or it killed you, one or the other. <laughs> that's the and that's what John is playing at here, dead changing death to life. It could be the person is either healed or dies here when this cautery is applied and and he's using it as the image to try and convey to us 
this work of the Holy Spirit. So if this fire of love, that being of infinite power, can inestimably consume and transform into itself the soul it touches. Fire consumes, fire burns up. Can take completely into itself and transform with just little touch. Because that's with a quarter you just touch. If the touch is any bit too strong at all, the person is dead. So the touch has to be extremely gentle. And, and this is a touch with a fire that is infinitely powerful. Yet he burns each soul according to its preparation. He will burn one more, another less. And this he does in so far as he desires, and how and when he desires. When he wills to touch somewhat vehemently, the soul's burning reaches such a high degree of love that seems to surpass all the fires of the world, for he is an infinite fire of love. So the person is touching an infinite fire of love in some little way. As a result, in this union, the soul calls the Holy Spirit a quarter. Because there is nothing, a little touch, the gentlest little touch, heals everything. There can be no other wound that couldn't be healed because of this. John goes on to clarify it a little bit here. It's a wonderful thing and worth relating that... Since this fire of God is so mighty, it will consume a thousand worlds more easily than the fire of this earth would burn up a straw. It does not consume and destroy the soul in which it so burns. And it does not afflict us. Rather, commensurate with the strength of the love, it divinizes, divinizes and delights it burning gently within it. So it doesn't. It may appear to. It may seem to a person going through the healing, the painful process of healing in whatever form that healing is taking, but it never does. It's gentle. And it is always in accordance with the person's strength. So God never asks one to carry something that they cannot carry. Or takes one to a place that they cannot endure. Even though it may seem like that to the person at the time. God doesn't. This is a gentle God. So this wound that he speaks about, that was because that was the method of healing. You healed by wounding. A person has a wound, and they come with a cauterize and effectively create a bigger wound to heal the previous wound. That was the sort of the logic of these methods. As I say, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And here it is, John is applying it here to all the need of healing that a human being has. From wherever that need of healing comes. Tells us whether a soul is wounded by other wounds of miseries and sins, or whether it is healthy, this cautery of love immediately affects a wound of love in the one it touches, and these one wounds deriving from other causes become wounds of love. So the wounds, this 
transforming the wounds that a person has. They become the very place of healing. He uses here the term immediately, because that's, as I mentioned last night in introducing this work, there's a timelessness in this work, because it is all focusing upon the work of God. And God is always outside of time. But when we're reading it, clearly, and this is the very clever way that John has written this. It's all in the present. But we look back to the past and we go forward to the future. But yet everything is happening at a level above that or beyond that. In the timelessness, that's God. So to apply that to this process of healing here. When John says the Holy Spirit just does this, we could, oh, this happens immediately. In the life of a person, this could take a whole lifetime. But the principle remains the same. The place of woundedness is the place of healing. And that's where the Holy Spirit is going to work. That's where the flame is going to work. But of course the person has to cooperate with this. And perhaps over a long period of time it takes to come to the point where one can fully cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit. It will involve going to those very painful places. At times those very painful places will become even more painful. as one exposes them to the healing power of the Holy <coughs> Spirit. Just like a wound that is infected or septic, getting gangrenous or whatever, when this cauterizer is applied to it, it will heal it. It will purify it, it will burn off whatever is infected but it will cause greater pain for a while, and maybe for a long time. But that is the healing process. That's how it will appear to the person. So the wound of love that he speaks about here in such gentle and beautiful terms, in the reality of human life, it can appear to the person to be very, very painful, and will be, but it is the place of healing. The spirit has to come into these places. They have to be exposed to him in order to be healed. As I said, the way it is spoken about here, it's a looking back on it. It's a celebration of it. But we mustn't kind of see it in some kind of idealized way. It's the, this can be a long process, a painful process, but it's the wound of love. Yet, there's a difference between this loving cautery, that's the Holy Spirit, and a cautery produced by material fire, which all John's readers will be very aware of. There is a difference. The wound left by material fire is only curable by other medicines, whereas the wound affected by the cautery of love is incurable through medicine. But a very cautery that causes it, cures it, and by curing it, causes it. It's good. <coughs> as often as the cautery of love touches the wound of love, it causes a deeper wound of love, 
and thus the more it wounds, the more it cures and heals. In those of you familiar with John the Cross's spiritual canticle, we'll see this idea, for want of a better word, played out through the whole canticle. At the beginning, very first stanza, the person is wounded with love. And nothing will heal this wound. The person goes on a frantic search for the lover. To use John's, the stag that has fled. But nothing else. She'll search for the lover among creation, people, all over, everywhere. But nothing, only the beloved, can cure this wound of love. But it's the wound of love that has awakened and inspired the person to go on the spiritual journey. And there in the canticle, as I'd be, long spiritual journey. Here, of course, one is looking at it in the timelessness which the flame is. And of course, John is writing the flame for people who are already familiar with his canticle, so they will know immediately what he's referring to here when he speaks about this wound of love. And they'll know that it's not some instant thing, but when a person is touched by the wound of love, there is a long process of searching. Because nothing, nothing will fulfill the person except the lover, who's God, the Holy Trinity, Holy Spirit, however we pray. So, so this can only be healed by the one that has caused it. But in the process, in the dynamics of the canticle, the one that has caused it remains elusive for so long until the person has been changed and transformed and is able to then meet. Here's how he puts it here in the flame. The more wounded the lover the healthier the lover is. Because the more it has been touched by this love. Though it may not, it may not seem like this for a long time, but it is. Because the more wounded, the more it feels the need of the love. Love is the part of this process of love growing by absence, emptiness, need, desire. Love will grow. So the more wounded it is, the healthier the lover is. And the cure caused by love is to wound and inflict wound upon wound <coughs> to such an extent that the entire soul is dissolved into a wound of love. And now all cauterized and made one wound of love it is completely healthy in love, for it has transformed into love. There's a profound paradox at the base of that. It's completely transformed into love by this working of the Holy Spirit that brings about this healing. This is what is under... <coughs> Sorry, give a lot of little bit of this and then we'll finish. This is what is understood by the wound of which the soul, all wounded and all healthy, it's all wounded and all healthy at the one time. So many things here are paradoxical. The more it is in need of the healing of the cautery, the more healthy it is. Complete opposite to where it would operate in the physical. Because the more wounded it is, the wounding has been done by the Holy Spirit, it's more absorbed into the Holy Spirit. So all, it's all wounded and all healthy.
Even though the soul is all wounded and all healthy, the courtry of love does not fail to fulfill its task, which is to touch and wound with love. Be wholly delightful and completely sound, the wound brings delight, just as a good doctor usually does. That's why it is delight it is delightful wound. This is a Now he addresses the wound. O oh, then wound, so much more delightful is the fire of love that causes higher and more sublime. The Holy Spirit produces it only for the sake of giving delight, and his, and his will to delight the soul is great. This wound will be great, for it will be extremely delightful. So it is a celebration of this. This total healing that takes place. O oh, then delightful wound, so much more sublimely delightful, the more the cautery touches the intimate centre, the substance of the soul. So it's got back this term again that we saw this morning, trying to trying to find language that will bring us deepest. That's where the, that's where it happens. That's where this and that's where everything is healed from there. For this cautery is a touch only is, sorry, is a touch only of divinity in the soul, without any intellectual or imaginative form or figure. So there's no there's no way of knowing this in any way, except through its effects, through the healing that has taken place. The person's wounds have been healed, the lifetime wounds and struggles that the person has carried have been healed. But there is, they've been done so by a touch that is totally unknown at any physical or psychological level. But it's a healing that cannot happen in any other way. All the wounds of a person, Whatever they have been, however deep-rooted they may have been, however painful they were, however debilitating they were, have been healed. Not physical wounds, of course, it's psychological wounds, moral wounds, sinfulness, mis whatever, whatever kind those wounds may have been. Sometimes they might be physical as well, miracles, but usually they're spiritual but the more deeply spiritual ones that are that happen here, that are that this presence brings about, this presence of the Trinity. In that deeper centre. Okay, so that's maybe enough about that. You can go on and you can have a look at it for Notice here, particularly in this stanza, but indeed, oh, right, to I alerted you to yesterday, the, the strong emphasis here upon touch, experience, feeling, the gentle hands, the delicate touch. The, but that's this is what this is what is experienced. And, Something truly great to say. Just want to finish with. Get he finishes this stand his commentary and this stand in celebration, because this is what's to be celebrated. The wounds, the healing. What the spirit brings about. And so. <clears throat> The action is to celebrate. It's a wonderful, he finishes his commentary in wonderful celebration. Just finish it, wait a bit. There's no need to be amazed that the soul so frequently walks amid this joy, jubilance, fruition, and praise of God. Besides the knowledge it has of the favours received, it feels in this state 
that God is so solicitous in regaling us with precious, delicate and enhancing words, and extolling it by various favours, that has no one else in the world to favour, nor anything else to do, that everything is for the soul alone. various songs of praise there, so it's to praise God, so that's, okay. That's just a little of what he's speaking about here in the second stanza, but I'm just pointing out that particular aspect of it, this aspect of healing, which is a very important aspect for all of us in our life. We cannot come to God without being healed. We cannot come to God without allowing him to heal us. <clears throat> and here in this flame, John is bringing us into the celebration of healing. And just as he's doing all the time, you're simply pointing us to this. Pointing us to this effect of the presence and life of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit in the deepest center of the person. Okay, so tomorrow morning I'll pick up a little bit from the third and fourth stanzas, again just dipping in. So we'll be evening prayer at 5.30, and then this evening from 7.30 to 8.30, some of us will be available for the confessions of the two rooms in the bar, but in here, next door, so we'll be